Herzlich willkommen beim Netzpolitischen Abend der digitalen Gesellschaft. Heute wieder wie jeden ersten Dienstag im Monat in der Seabase. Wir freuen uns ganz besonders, dass es auch einen Livestream gibt. Also hallo alle Leute zu Hause. Das heißt aber auch, es gibt einen Livestream. Das heißt, wenn ihr hier durchlauft, dann könnt ihr auf, aufgezeichnet werden. Und es werden auch Fotos gemacht. Das heißt, wenn ihr keine Fotos von euch wollt, dann sagt ihm Bescheid oder haltet die Hand davor oder so. Das müssen wir aber auf jeden Fall ansagen, weil wir sind ja auch ein Datenschutzverein. Also danke nochmal an die Seabase, danke fürs Fotos machen. Wir haben ein ganz wunderbares Programm für euch vorbereitet. Das stelle ich euch jetzt kurz vor. Und zwar haben wir als erstes Ben Scott mit einer Einführung in die Netzneutralität. Dieser Talk wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Hallo auch an alle Internationalen. Hello for all our international participants. Hey, we have some people here who only speak English, so that's really useful. Um, danach gibt es eine... Ja, Einführung in die Netzneutralitätsdebatte in Deutschland, ein Update von Markus, was alles äh, in den letzten Wochen passiert ist im Bereich Drosselcom und so weiter. Dann haben wir eine kleine Live-Schalte zu Johannes Scheller, dem Initi... Ah, er ist hier, cool, willkommen. <lacht> ah, da. <lacht> wir hatten eine Live-Schalte geplant, es ist sogar richtig live, total genial. Er hat die ähm, E-Petition zur Netzneutralität eingereicht, die mittlerweile sogar über 70.000 Unterzeichner hat und sogar noch zwei Wochen läuft. Also ihr könnt noch alle mitzeichnen, falls ihr das noch nicht gemacht habt. Und danach gibt es Clemens Funktional Kaputt Schrimpe, ähm, den ihr wahrscheinlich alle von seinem kleinen Zitat kennt, das aus einem Podcast ausgeschnitten wurde. Wir wissen, wie er aussieht, weil er steht hier ganz vorne und sitzt ähm, in der ersten Reihe. Genau, und er wird über die technischen Hintergründe der Netzneutralität sprechen. Danach, ist das jetzt auch noch mit hier drauf? Nein. Ähm, danach haben wir noch ein ganz kurzes Update zu unserer Initiative Recht auf Remix, zu der Leonard Dobusch dann noch zwei, drei Worte sagen wird. Genau, und jetzt herzlich willkommen, Ben Scott. Dankeschön. Er spricht jetzt über Net Neutrality and I give you the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, I love coming to places where I can give talks and drink at the same time. <laughs> it's always a sign. Yeah, it's a sign of a good event. Um, so, net neutrality. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is 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 give you my sort of philosophical foundation for net neutrality. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, uh, fought the net neutrality wars in the U.S. for many years, including in the dark ages when the Bush administration uh, was trying to legislate net neutrality out of existence and no one really knew what it was. Um, we started with the principle that we had to explain to people who were using the internet why they needed to save the internet. And we were stuck with Tim Wu's term, net neutrality, which in the beginning we thought was a real liability. This was a very difficult thing to explain to people, net neutrality, what did that mean? And so we started with this idea, end to end. End to end, the design principle of the internet, an engineering concept. A simple idea that when you create a network to maximize the utility for the most number of users, What you want to do is put the intelligence at the edge of the network and ensure that any message sent across the network is sent end to end without interference and without discrimination. Simple idea, baked into the internet from its beginning. That's the core concept that we fought for on net neutrality. I think it continues to be the primary and principal theme. It proved to be a very attractive idea. Soon we were not thinking about net neutrality as a burden that we had to carry, a problem we had to explain because people got it. During the big campaign for net neutrality in the US 2006, 2007, 2008, more than a million people contacted the government and asked for net neutrality rule. The level of participation in the regulatory agency went through the roof. We developed a huge group of citizen experts on telecommunications and technology regulation. We found a presidential candidate called Barack Obama who would state his support for net neutrality. And we sort of got a net neutrality rule. 
out of the White House and the Federal Communications Commission in 2010. But this fight continues to happen over and over because we don't fully solve the problem of net neutrality. We don't bake the idea of end-to-end -end into the law. The same problem that we had over and over in Washington is also plaguing Brussels, and the same problem is happening here. Everyone agrees that this is an important idea, but there's no finality. There's no legal or legislative solution that fixes end-to-end -end into the law. But ultimately, what we're talking about is, we can call it internet freedom, we can call it non-discrimination, we can call it end-to-end, -end, we can call it net neutrality. It's about how users expect the internet to work. We expect to sit in front of a computer, contact any other person or any other piece of information on the network anywhere in the world without discrimination by the owner of the network that carries the packet from one end to the other. It's about an open or a closed system. It's not that complicated. For every legislator and every regulator who I talked to who said, I can't make a law on this because it's too complicated, I say, what's too complicated about open versus closed? Simple idea. Pick it up. If you want to get a little bit more complicated, it's about who controls how open or closed the network is and why. Because when you get down into the technical details, of course, it does get more complicated. Network operators don't treat every packet exactly the same. TCP IP doesn't treat every packet exactly the same. The question is, who controls how open or closed and why? And over and over, we have big telecommunications companies testing our patience and our sanity with their repeated attempts to in to bring, non -dis to bring discrimination into the marketplace, to violate the end-to-end -end principle. But we can't really be surprised. Without a law that prevents them from doing that, it is in their financial interest to do it. If they did not try to violate net neutrality, it would be irresponsible to their shareholders. It is not Deutsche Telekom who has failed. It is the government that's failed. To expect the market to behave in a public interest way when it is profitable not to is irrational. That's why government exists. To make decisions on behalf of society, to shape the market, to produce outcomes that are good for all of us and not just specific economic actors. But we haven't got that solution. We continue to be in this tug of war over and over and over the same debate about net neutrality. And I think the missing piece, the fundamental philosophical truth about this, is a simple one. How does government preserve the end-to-end -end principle? How do we legislate net neutrality? It's a simple, simple litmus test, a bright line rule. Do we think of the internet as a public good or as a commercial service? Well, it's both. So how do we prioritize? Do we think first as a legal matter it should be a public good and then a commercial service or do we think first it should be a commercial service and then a public good? Because if you prioritize commercial service, public good comes so far in second place you won't even see it anymore. And so public good has to be the priority, not to say it won't be a commercial market, not to say there won't be a competitive market, but laws can shape the market so that commercial activities, competition, produce first public good second commercial game. So then we come to the question of net neutrality. It becomes even simpler. If you want to have a, the internet as a public good, then you have to think about n what non-discrimination means and what a business model based on discrimination means. Because what you're saying, if you're selling discrimination, if I am saying to Marcus, I'm going to give you the opportunity to pay me to have your traffic go faster than Sundress. And I'll give you the same opportunity to pay me. But if you're going to be paying for prioritization, if you're going to be paying for premium access to my network, the resource that I'm selling you, the scarce resource that I'm selling you, is bandwidth. And so my incentive as a network operator is to keep that bandwidth small. And I've got to make sure that when I sell you a prioritized service, what you're getting is worthwhile. Dropbox clearly wants a prioritized service. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the logic of selling prioritization is a network of scarcity. It's a simple economic concept. If I'm making money selling you prioritization, I have to maintain scarcity in my network. That's good. That might be good for my business model as a network operator, but it is terrible for the country's infrastructure. And this is one of those fundamental points where the priorities and the values and the goals of the commercial marketplace left alone are in complete contradiction to the public good goals of producing a better, faster, future-proof, affordable infrastructure. And that's where government comes in. Government comes in and says, we don't want a marketplace based on scarcity. We want a marketplace based on abundance because abundance is what grows our infrastructure. And this is the internet. It's a public good. It's not just you selling access to the internet. It's the thing that makes our economy work. It's the thing that provides social services and welfare. It's the thing that provides open government. It's the thing that fuels education and healthcare and on down the list. We need abundance. We cannot permit business models based on the idea of selling scarcity. That's the red line. When the regulator or the legislator is writing the rule, the simple interpretation is, does this business model base its idea of making money on abundance or on scarcity? If it's based on scarcity, it can't be permitted. Full stop. Then we'll let the engineers fight over which technique is better and which is least intrusive in order to solve technical problems. Fine. But this is the high-level principle we have to hang on to. Who controls how opened and closed and why? It's the why part that we have to pay the most attention to. Why is about scarcity or abundance. And what it leads to is it leads us to try to get past the idea that this debate over net neutrality is somehow only about money, only about divvying up who gets what percentage of the value that comes out of the internet marketplace. If you read 90% of the stories in the mainstream press about net neutrality, you would think this is nothing more than a business dispute between Google and Deutsche Telekom. Both of them, big greedy companies, want to figure out who can get what percentage of the market away from the other. That story is a story based on the logic of scarcity. They're fighting over scarce resources. But we've just got done deciding <laughs> that the internet cannot be based on scarcity. It's got to be based on abundance. This debate is not about Google. This debate is not about Deutsche Telekom. This is a debate about government setting clear rules to protect the end-to-end -end principle so that the internet is a public good based on a business model of abundance that grows the infrastructure for everyone, permits a commercial marketplace, encourages competition, allows everybody to make a profit, prioritizes the public good. That means you. That means the citizen, the individual consumer, the individual citizen user of the internet is the most important actor in the net neutrality debate. And that is the fundamental principle of net neutrality. I'll stop and hand the microphone to Marcus Beckadai. Ganz kurzer Hinweis, bitte schreibt euch alle eure Fragen schon mal auf. Wir haben ja jetzt vier Vorträge zur Netzneutralität und machen jetzt nicht nach jedem einmal eine Fragerunde, sondern ihr habt dann zum Schluss einfach die Möglichkeit, alle Fragen zu stellen. Vielleicht haben sich dann auch manche schon erledigt, weil zum Beispiel ähm, die Technik dann schon...